All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure this morning to introduce our grand round speaker, an expert in pediatric stroke, Dr. Nomazulo Dlamini from the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Dr. Dlamini first joined Sick Kids in 2008 as a clinical research fellow in the stroke program. Prior to this, she had earned her medical degree from the University College of London, additionally earning her master in pediatrics, and she completed her pediatric specialty training in pediatrics and pediatric neurology. She worked as a staff neurologist at the Evelina Children's Hospital, Guys in St. Thomas Hospital in London, specializing in stroke, neuromuscular diseases, and complex neurofibromatosis, prior to returning to sick kids in 2014 as an assistant professor and staff physician in neurology and stroke. In 2017, Dr. Domini completed her PhD, examining the use of hypercapnic challenge bold MRI cerebrovascular reactivity studies in children with arteriopathy. Her research, embedded in the Stroke Imaging Lab for Children, aims to explore the mechanisms of injury, repair, and recovery in pediatric stroke using multimodal imaging and computational analysis to improve the interventions and outcomes in this group. She is currently the Associate Director of Research and Education and the director of the Children's Stroke Program at Sick Kids. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Welcome, Dr. Domini. Thank you for the kind introduction and um, just for having me here this morning. I, you know, was uh, sad that I couldn't actually be there in person, and so I figured that I should actually find out a bit more about Pittsburgh. So um, I have done my own research. And I have found out a couple of things, none of which will be of um, will be new to you, but this is my virtual trip to Pittsburgh. And so I realize that you guys live in the city of bridges, and that you have more bridges than Venice, that you gave birth to the Klondike bar, Heinz ketchup, which I was certain was British, and the Big Mac. So I think there's a lot of things we part of. And then the fact that you actually are the home and the birthplace of Mr. Rogers neighborhood. So, you know, I'm sad that I'm not with you in person, but again, I'm really grateful for the invite today and I'm happy to be with you. So I have no disclosures and uh, just where did things begin for me? So I became interested in stroke when I was a, I guess, early resident um, using sort of North American speak. And, uh, one of the days in the days of 24 hours, seven days a week on call, there was a girl who came in and I'll call her Deja and she's six years old at the time. She came to our day unit um, in one of the London hospitals with a limp and they thought that she had irritable hip. Her background history was that she had sickle cell disease and it turned out that she had had a stroke. And I did not know that children had strokes. I was really blown away. And I was certain that, okay, if children have strokes and particularly children who have sickle cell disease, there must be lots of protocols. Everybody must be running around these children and, you know, great guidelines. And it turned out that was not the case. But I was very fortunate, as many of you who are in the audience, junior trainees, will be too, and that is to have great mentors. So look to your mentors and see what you can learn from them and it should always be driven by those interests that really come from you know what resonated with you and what you know motivates you so the beginning of my journey was this girl that i called deja i didn't know children could have strokes but they obviously do and so over the last two decades we have been trying to define the landscape and I say we because it really is a global community that's been moving our understanding of paediatric stroke forward. And first we'd be started by just trying to be clear about what we're talking about and classify childhood stroke. So as you all know stroke can be both ischemic or hemorrhagic, venous or arterial, and if it's venous it's CSVT and if it's arterial it's arterial ischemic stroke. And for the purpose of the talk today, I will be talking about arterial ischemic stroke, that focal acquired brain injury that occurs when there's a sudden interruption to blood flow within a vascular territory in the brain. And, you know, the so what question. So what? Children have strokes, okay, it might be stunning and might be unexpected. The so what's are that stroke remains one of the top 10 causes of death in infants less than a year that over 10% of children who have strokes still die, 
that 20 to 30 percent of those children will have another stroke and that 70 percent or more have long-term neurological deficits. We've also come to realize in more recent work that one in four of these children have mental health issues. And so many of our children who had a neonatal stroke who obviously can't even remember the fact that they had it and may not have a physical visible disability will actually have mental health challenges that if we weren't doing the work that we're all doing to follow and listen to these children and families, we wouldn't know. So there is clearly a lifelong impact on the individual, family and society. We've come to understand that presentations are, obviously, are often influenced by age. And so this is a real typical um, presentation for an infant, focal seizures. However, when you become older, focal hemiparesis or uh, hemiparesis is much more likely to be a presentation. But the reasons and the risk factors differ by age. So this is a very old slide that shows how presentations differ by age. And if you can see, I think it's over here, um, the different color bars that the yellow being neonate and the older child being the more sort of um, orangey color, that really when neonates present as mentioned, they typically have more seizures more of an encephalo encephalopathic type presentation, whereas the children have much more focal presentation. And so we also know that risk factors differ by age. The question is, you know, why does infection matter in some children and not matter in others? Why do children with the same genetic disorder, be it sickle cell disease or NF1, behave very differently. Their phenotypes are different. Some of them have a high risk of stroke, but not all of them. Some of them develop arteriopathy and not all of them. And then why is it that teenagers going to playgrounds from a stroke point of view is a bad idea? What is that association? What makes them more likely to have a dissection? That one child, lots of children go to playgrounds and they do just fine. And so it's become clear that there is an important association between gene, the gene and the environment. And those interactions are what are really coming together to give us this broad phenotype of pediatric stroke. And over the last two decades, we've also learned that outcomes differ by age. So that same stroke in a newborn infant, two-year-old and a 75-year-old will have very different outcomes. But the neurological deficits are significant in both groups over time. And we know that those regionally specific differences and the differences in outcome are really about the way, the very organized way that the brain develops throughout childhood into adulthood. But what hasn't changed and the questions that haven't changed over time remain, you know, from parents. I didn't know kids had a stroke. Kids have a stroke. Will my child have another stroke? Can I predict how they will do over time? Will they walk? Will they talk? Can I predict if they will have another stroke? And how do we improve outcomes? And so those questions remain unchanged. And unfortunately, despite our amazing progress in the field, our approach to management of stroke remains pretty blunted and hampered by our lack of mechanism targeted tools in our toolbox. And so one of the you know, real goals of this next, I would say decade or so of work is to try and move towards a much more precision targeted manner of diagnosis, risk stratification, treatment decision making, and outcome prediction. And so those sort of topics will cover what I'll be talking about today. And you'll see that throughout the talk, I'll be talking, I'll mention neuroimaging, because neuroimaging is one of the elements that's really going to launch what we're able to do, take us into this new phase, and help us understand by broader, deeper phenotyping, we will be able, hopefully, to be more diagnostically specific and be able to predict our outcomes in a much cleaner way than we have to date. So our first major challenge is making the diagnosis. And this is a pretty old slide too, and publication by Mubin Raffae in Stroke 2009, 
where she really highlighted that that sort of um, the timeline from symptom onset to stroke diagnosis, trying to understand where the delays occur. And what was clear from the work that she did, that even then, was that parents are actually very good at knowing that something's wrong with their child and bringing them forward for medical attention. Unfortunately, what her study also showed was that one of the worst places to have a stroke is in the hospital. And so many others have, have confirmed the sort of these delays in diagnosis that happened throughout from symptom onset to diagnosis through other publications, including Melissa Schack and Mark Mackey. And so um, it's quite clear that early recognition is key and that needs to happen both at a community level, obviously the families are seeing it, but also we need to just have those processes in place that will allow once a child picks up the phone and says, I am worried about my child, get them to the hospital in a speedy fashion and fast enough for us to do the right things. And so institutional preparedness is key. And this slide, and it's, I know, painfully, you know, bullet by bullet uh, listing all the people involved, but it's really quite deliberate because it's just to say that the management of stroke requires a multidisciplinary team approach. Engagement with all of our colleagues, with our colleagues in all of these disciplines is key, all the way from, ideally, from a community point of view, community setting first, and even education of the children and families through to ICU and beyond. We've had at least a couple, well, at least there's one child that I can remember very clearly who was in um, a, a dance class and dropped to the ground. And because of an education session that she had recently had at her school around stroke, she turned to her um, dance teacher and said, I think I'm having a stroke, please call the ambulance. And she was absolutely right. And they got to us in record time. Our nurse practitioner here, Ish, um, Ishvinda Vatal, who was amazing, has been doing a lot of community outreach. And we can almost see the, we, we can see the effect of her community outreach as she gets to each of those hospitals. And so what I mean by that is she goes to the different hospitals, speaks to their eMERGE teams and, and pediatric teams, talks to, them, talks to them about stroke recognition and then imaging choices. And I'll talk about that in the next and the upcoming slides. And um, literally we'll get children coming in from those hospitals within weeks some sometimes days after she's been there. And the, processes have become much more seamless and that's because the time has been taken to communicate the, our understanding and um, approaches to recognition. And so a core component of institutional preparedness is availability of neuroimaging and this is a real difficult one for um, many of us and that has changed over time and a lot of that depends on the way we advocate for what we need so this is really just an example of a child who presented with seizures a neonate presented with seizures at day two of life and on the ct where they were diagnosed as having um, diffuse hie but on the mri you can see that these are bilateral strokes and so, you know, we know that CT is insensitive for the diagnosis of stroke, particularly when it's done early or if there's posterior fossa involvement. And so, you know, being able to get that MRI is key to being able to make the diagnosis of stroke in a, in a timely fashion, particularly in children. And we know it differs from adults because in children, one of the real challenges that we face is the fact that over 50% of children who present with a vocal motor deficit will have a stroke mimic. And so how we differentiate between those mimics so that we can actually in, um, institute the right therapy in a timely fashion is key. And the MRI is what allows us to do that. We know that CT can be false negative in over 50% of cases and that the delay and it delays our diagnosis. And so wherever possible, the MRI should be expedited. I know that, you know, institutionally that may cause challenges and I don't know what it's like at your hospital. But what we did, um, you know, 
I guess, of over a decade or so ago, when we were facing the challenges that many others do face in trying to advocate for the MRI was making the point that, you know, having a stroke is akin to or similar to being at risk of loss of life or limb. And so um, in our institution there are pathways and certain terms if you that you use that if you use them will allow you to have a priority one or priority two MRI and priority one is if you know that presentation puts you at high risk of loss of life or limb then you get a priority one scan and so by you know having the conversations with our colleagues and other departments we've been able to get um, MRI as the first um, imaging for children with suspected stroke. And so the next thing, thinking about diagnostic specificity, specificity. We've made the diagnosis, we know that the child has stroke and this is somebody that I will call TJ or Tim, but you've met a child like this in the past. So they have a basal ganglia stroke, having presented with a sudden onset weakness and they've had their MRI done. And so now I'm going to ask you for some thoughts and for some um, participation. I don't know if everybody is muted and whether they're able to unmute themselves. But my question to you is, what do you think the diagnosis is in this child? Apart from stroke. Thomas, I don't know if we're unable to unmute people or Colleen. I'm not hearing anything back. Since it's a webinar, no one else can unmute. You're the only speaker. Ah, uh, okay. So I hope what came to mind was three different potential differentials. Maybe moya moya. So for some of you, transient cerebral arteriopathy or new speak focal cerebral arteriopathy of infancy. And some might have thought dissection, but you know, moya moya or TCA slash FCA. But it matters because depending on what you diagnose based on those images, both parenchymal as well as vascular, the treatments differ. So, you know, if you think it's more and more, you're going to consider revascularization surgery. If you think it's FCA, particularly inflammatory type or vasculitis, you may consider steroids. Probably in both situations, you'd consider heparin or aspirin. This was a study that we conducted um, and I was a fellow, which really just highlighted how difficult it is to be certain about a diagnosis given um, historical imaging techniques. And so most of our imaging techniques are essentially luminal and MRA isn't truly luminal, it's inferred luminal. But if you can see on that sort of circled area on the, the MRA, um, that there is loss of signal, and then there is this area of increased signal in that final panel. But this child was thought to have a transient cerebral arteriopathy. And within the series, unfortunately, what we realized is that three of the children who had been diagnosed with a transient cerebral arteriopathy actually posthumously, so on post-mortem, had intracranial arterial dissection. The third child, we were able to, the fourth child rather, who, um, who didn't die, we did, we conducted arterial wall imaging in them. And we were able to recognize this pattern of highlighting um, within the internal carotid arteries within the MCA. And so that enabled us to actually be more definitive about this child having intracranial arterial dissection rather than transient cerebral arteriopathy. And so the adult, our adult colleagues really have led in this space and their early papers, one particular one by Schwartz et al, published in 2009, suggested that A arterial wall imaging is not only feasible, but that there are patterns of enhancement that are suggestive of a specific etiology. In our own series, um, published in Stroke in 2018, and the Stents et al. series published in Stroke in 2017, and, and these are the two childhood series that are out there, what we realize is that the, the patterns of enhancement tell you about 
wall involvement, yes, no, but there's um, suggested adult diagnostic specificity isn't clearly apparent in children. And so it does aid with diagnosis, but our interpretation of those findings is still evolving. But it also showed us that there's a temporal relationship between enhancement and disease activity. So this is something that we now have um, uh, adapted in our institutional pro uh, program. And there are other papers that are out, out now by uh, Wintermark and Fulton showing that as you're trying to be more diagnostically specific, adding on arterial wall imaging does help um, arrive at a diagnosis. And so we've made our diagnosis. We think we are you know, a bit more specific about it. And then we want to start treating. And we know that time is brain and that what we're trying to do is really um, try to prevent recruitment of the penumbra into the ischemic core. We know that we can't really do anything about the dead brain, but we don't want that to be extended. And so early management of ischemic stroke is to prevent further stroke, prevent uh, secondary brain injury, but they also want to find the cause. And so one of the really exciting developments over the last decade really has been the evolution of hyperacute therapies. So thrombolysis and embolectomy. And it's been a challenge for us in our field to really understand the risk versus the benefits of both thrombolysis and embolectomy. Initially trying to understand um, the benefits and what to do from a thrombolysis point of view in children, we had the TIPS trial, which was led by Kate LaFond, who's currently in Seattle. And that was a, a randomized controlled trial with a very sophisticated methodological approach to try and a, a determine safety and dosing of TPA in childhood, but then ultimately you know, show through this process whether it was efficacious and whether um, you know, it was a superior treatment. But unfortunately, that trial had to end early because of failed recruitment and difficulty in recruitment into the trial, which really shows a difficulty in our space as, a, as what is considered yet a rare disorder, but the significant impact um, across the lifespan, how to actually uh, you know, move the needle forward and, and, and actually gain or get that evidence that will back up the things that we do. So we're trying to you know, increase neuronal survival, but there are risks to everything that we do. And so with embolectomy, which is really where we have gone in the more recent years, there are concerns and risks around arterial wall injury, the reperfusion injury, as well as hemorrhage. But you know, we recognizing that this was coming to us anyway, as in with the publication of the trials Dawn and Diffuse um, in the say 2014, 2015, people always extrapolate into childhood. And so we understood that there'd be this sort of extrapolation into childhood um, of the, these procedures or these um, interventions. And so we got together um, at an institutional level with our colleagues in radiology, hematology, thrombosis, cardiology, and also invited um, a dear colleague, uh, Dr. Weichord from Chop to help us with the discussion of really trying to get ready for if and when um, a child presented with a stroke who we thought, and we had to determine the criteria, who would we um, consider a th uh, EVT mechanical thrombectomy in? And literally over a week after we had put our guidelines and protocol together, we had this child um, have a stroke on our cardiac critical care cardiac unit and uh, were able to reflect on the importance of having been prepared at an institutional level to actually do this. But it's important to say that we really cannot simply extrapolate from adult literature into our space. And therefore, we all have to take stock and make sure that whatever we, decisions we make for our institutions, it, it makes sense and that we have the infrastructure capacity um, to conduct what are potentially, potentially high risk procedures. We can't extrapolate because we know that children were not included in any of the major trials, that the risks are not the same as adults. Arteries are smaller and they may be more thrombotic and just technically more difficult. 
And then when we think of any high risk procedure, we have to think, well, risk versus benefit. And there is good you know, evidence to suggest that children will do better or do well enough over time anyway. And so, you know, our, when we're choosing risky therapies, we have to think, you know, am I really, am I really I mean, you know, making the right decision for this child? And so it is fair and appropriate to say that it really isn't the standard of care in pediatrics and that we do still consider TPA first, that there are unknown risks and unquantified benefits. But we do um, actually just, you know, take it case by case. Um, and historically, we'd said, OK, we'll do it in the older teenagers, those with therapeutically anticoagulated, which are typically the children on a VAD machine and so on. But those age limits have definitely gone, you know, lower and lower and lower. And we will now um, conduct an embolectomy or, uh, or endovascular therapy procedure in a child over two in the right circumstances but we always um it's it's never an easy decision and we always make it as a team okay so moving on to predicting risk so we know that a child has had a stroke we know the cause of the stroke we've become more etiologically specific We've chosen our acute or hyperacute therapy. But in some situations, we want to understand risk and be able to predict a bit more than um, you know, standardly able. So you know, we want to know from a stroke point of view, risk of occurrence when a child has an arteriopathy, of which there are many that often are asymptomatic, like facies and ACTA2 and radiation vasculopathy. And then even when a child has had the stroke, as mentioned before, we want to know about the risk of recurrence. And so in this panel of images, I have you know, all these children with arteriopathies you can see in the lower panel. And what can we say about their risk of recurrence? So some of them have moya moya, some of them have tachyasis arteritis, and some of them have transient cerebral arteriopathy or FCA. What we do know about children with arteriopathy is that they are the ones who have a higher risk of recurrence. They're the ones with poorer outcomes of children. I and mean, when we think of all children who have strokes, they're the ones with poorer outcomes. And they're the ones who have recurrence despite our advances in treatment. So this is despite the fact that most of the children who have an arterial ischemic stroke now will have been anticoagulated will be on aspirin long term. And despite that, they're still having recurrent strokes. And so we have to really start thinking as to what are we missing? But when we think about prediction, um, this type of presentation or child, so this is a case of a child who has moya moya, is a real difficult one for many of us who see these children long term or throughout childhood. So as Many of you know Moya Moya is a progressive intracranial stenoocclusive arteriopathy of childhood. It is non atherosclerotic, and there is actually no known treatment that present that can actually prevent the vascular progression. And so, primary prevention is really to do with um, trying to improve the cerebral blood flow, and we use aspirin for that or um, revascularization surgery does reduce ischemic events. But we want to know if these children are going to have a stroke and what their risk of stroke is in the future, because some of them are diagnosed as, as young as one or two or three and haven't had a stroke. And we know this vasculopathy is going to be progressive. So how can we do that? Well, for those who recognize who this is, it might be aging us a little bit. Um, but we would like to say that we have the technology. And so um, the, the actual principles that we apply and that allow us to do this is something called bold functional MRI imaging, which has been one of the, an area of interest me, for me for a while now. And so functional MRI imaging um, using the, tech, the fMRI principles um, and using a hypercapnic challenge or stimulus allows us to measure cerebrovascular activity, which really is just a measure of cerebral blood flow 
um, as over a unit of stimulus. And adult studies have shown that this is a, a marker of cerebrovascular reserve, a predictor of ischemic risk, as well as a, a predictor of cognitive decline. And I like to think of it as um, really a card, the cardiac stress test of the brain. And so this is, a, I think, a really good illustrative example of how this helps us. So this is a, um, a panel of images of a 17-year-old patient with Moya Moya, who had paroxysmal episodes of limb paresthesia. And you can see with this arrow um, where the arteriopathy is, but the MRI, standard MRI scan looks normal. Diffusion was normal and flare was normal. But the functional image told us if yellow, red is positive reactivity, meaning a normal relationship between CO2. So if your CO2 goes up, you increase blood flow and you would then be within the yellow red spectrum. But with these studies, because they are um, we use this hypercapnic challenge in the affected vascular bed, when you increase that CO2 rather than the blood flow going up, blood flow is diverted away from that area. And then you have this negative response called steel. And we know that that negative blue range response is associated with, as mentioned in the previous slide, risk of stroke as well as, as, well as risk of um, cognitive decline. And so we now have implemented this in our standard practice because um, there are different methods of actually measuring CVR, but the many of the historical methods um, require nuclear med are based on nuclear medicine techniques and from an institutional point of view um, are labor intensive and have risk to the child. Whereas many of these children have MRIs and MRAs throughout um, childhood as well as adulthood. And this is a way of us being able to see um, how they are doing at a functional level over time. And so we have now published on this and um, the, this actual survival curve isn't in the publication, but we have shown that even in children still predicts survival over time. And even when you account for surgery and, and the laterality of the steel, that um, if you have bilateral steel, your survival outcome over time is less than if you have unilateral. And it's certainly different from whether you have um, no steel at all. And so um, in the series that we, we published, we demonstrated that the presence of steel was associated with a threefold increased risk of ischemic events when compared to no steel, and that is similar to adult studies. And so we now um, feel that we have demonstrated in a children that hypercapnic challenge bold CVR is potentially a biomarker of ischemic risk, um, but obviously larger studies need to be. Um, conducted. And so finally, will my child recover? Will they walk? Will they talk? How do we predict outcome? And so there are many um, different ways of doing this, many of them traditional and standardized and some of them much more, um, more, more novel. And so I won't be talking about diffusion kurtosis imaging or specifically about diffusion tensor imaging, but, you know, just recognizing what we already have and what is really part of standard care and has been to date. So malignant MCA syndrome. And that's when you have an infarct, which is substantial, as you can see, and greater than two thirds of MCA territory and early midline shift. And it's important to recognize this on imaging. I don't think any of us would miss it. Um, but colleagues have also published a predictors of um, of malignant MCA conversion. And seizures are important at, at, at presentation. Age, interestingly, is important at presentation and NIHSS score. So this is just to highlight what many of us would recognize and know already, but the importance of putting what we see clinically, uh, what we, we know clinically and um, together with that imaging to help us anticipate. And then we have to make decisions about early decompressive hemicraniectomy and so on. We know that acute MRI also predicts hemiparesis. And this work was started by uh, Linda de Vries many, many years ago, and it really has um, been quite beautiful in helping us to understand that just by recognizing the presence of diffusion restriction within the descending corticospinal tract, that is something that, you know, on from presentation, you can say to a family or you can know for yourself and have it as part of your counseling um, 
that they are likely to, to develop a hemiparesis and then you, you move your treatments forward accordingly. But stroke also is a model for studying neuroplasticity. Uh, it's, you know, been considered a, one of the best lesions, whatever, uh, for the study of reorganization after a focal abrupt insult. And what is really um, revealing and how stroke also helps us is that we know that they, it occurs throughout, the child, throughout childhood, of course, in adult too, adulthood too, but it's telling us about developmental neuroplasticity and, and critical windows that we could actually, if we could identify them, harness them to improve um, our interventions and target our interventions in, in a way that will allow us to optimize um, the outcomes in the, in the children. So um, our stroke program now has the Stroke Imaging Lab Laboratory for Children, and we aim to use multimodal imaging from um, fMRI to understand how children recover post-stroke, as well as diffusion tensor imaging um, and more novelly diffusion ketosis imaging. And a nice example of some of the work that we've been doing has been in understanding language or predicting language outcome post neonatal stroke. And so um, what we found in, is that, and you, I know that you know this, is that um, when a neonate has a stroke uh, in the left MCA territory, for example, unlike an adult, their recovery is actually very good. And so their core language recovery is, is almost normal, and um, if not entirely normal. And so for the longest time, we all sort of patted ourselves on the backs and said, oh, you know, maybe something we did, neuroplasticity, but from a language point of view, they're going to do well. But in following these children over time, we've come to realize that actually they have emergent language deficits. And those emergent language deficits happen around middle school and from the age of eight onwards. And these are, de these are deficits in higher order language. And so it's their social skills, it's their ability um, to have to recognize humor or nuance. Um, and so fMRI studies in, in adults have suggested that there are sort of typical patterns of organization for language, typical humor and, and social interactions. And that your pattern of reorganization following a focal insult will determine how well you do. And so, um, Essentially, if you reorganize around that area of injury, you have good outcomes. But if you don't reorganize at all, then your your um, outcome is not so good. And that, I guess, stands you know for reason. Our problem is that has been that our approach to treating these children really has been a very much one glove fits all. And so you've had a, a stroke, and we either wait for you to have a, a, an obvious deficit. Um, be that at age four, five, eight, or 10. Um, and then at that point, we institute the same therapy. But using sort of multimodal imaging approach, we believe that we can actually be a bit more precise and we help a whole load more precise in determining what sort of therapy a child should have. So that if a child, um, by virtue of looking at their standard MRI imaging, their diffusion imaging, and we're also doing MEG studies um, in children within this study, if their reorganization is suggestive of good or a good outcome, then they would have a standard, you know, preschool speech and language therapy um, program implemented for them. But if we see that their reorganization is not around the area of injury, but maybe in a homotopic area on the contralateral hemisphere, we know that they'll have some good recovery, but it's not necessarily going to be as good as um, you know, child one. And so for this child, we would use more individualized therapy targeted to their higher order language function specifically from early on. But then there are also those children who we recognize just don't reorganize at all. And then for those children, maybe we should be thinking about alternative approaches to therapy, non-traditional communication strategies, music therapy, art therapy, and so on, because we know that they are at highest risk of not reorganizing nor recovering their um, actual language function. 
So that was just, you know, one study that I wanted to share with you. And so we, within the program, we have a number of different imaging studies that are ongoing, where we're trying to understand, like I say, neuroplasticity and um, patterns of reorganization and predictors of good outcome by uh, virtue of their pattern of organization and so on. And so we have a prospective brain Canada imaging study, which um, despite the name does include many of our international American and other colleagues in both the IPSS arm as well as the prospective arm. And so this is from, to our knowledge, the first study where we're doing multimodal neuroimaging in children who've had a stroke um, at designated time points throughout the year. And so, um, like I say, this is really just to understand, um, you know, what are opportunities, what what's predicts um, extent of injury, but also what predicts outcome and therefore what our opportunities are to optimize, uh, minimize injury and optimize outcome ultimately are. And so what does the future hold? And, you know, we recognize that many of us have been um, functioning at single center institutional levels for the longest time. But, um, you know, one of the wonderful things uh, that we embrace is the need to work as this larger community, one of which Dana um, is very much part of, and that is going to be collaborations with each other who have those of us who have, you know, special interest in stroke, but also our colleagues in other subspecialties. Um, it's those collaborations which do take work and investment, but are really very, very joyful. Um, those are the collaborations that are going to advance our goals and help us improve our, our outcomes. That we need clinical trials and that we need to improve our understanding of stroke mechanisms through and the different opportunities that exist, including advanced neuroimaging. And so you might have heard me mention the IPSS already, and the IPSS is the International Pediatric Stroke Study, and this is again, I'm just mentioning Dana, who is a, a, our colleague um, in this endeavor, and this is, you know, the international network that was established in 2003 by one of my uh, very dear mentors, Dr. Gabrielle de Weber, and um, you know, having been established then by 11 co-investigators, we now have over 108 centers around the world, all collaborating to this um, international and global endeavor to actually improve outcomes in pediatric stroke, to understand better why children have stroke and then try to improve their outcomes. And we recognize that to be truly international and, and have global impact that, um, you know, we're very, uh, America and European centric right now with some um, involvement from India and Australia, but we, you know, in, our next goals are to just really support and bring in and understand what our colleagues need and um, on other continents around the world. Um, and so, you know, these, the, this is a summary of the talk and these are the challenges that remain. And um, as I mentioned, imaging is going to help us in harnessing our large data, and capitalizing our networks, I think is um, where we are and uh, we're looking forward to a bright future in this space. And so this is just a list of uh, my institutional colleagues and collaborators, as well as mentors um, and really just the end of my talk. So, so thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lumini. Um, that was such an amazing talk and again, really helpful um, for just us and, you know, thinking about how we are going to going forward manage pediatric stroke and how we can use especially imaging, um, you know, to kind of guide us with not only predicting risk, but also acutely uh, managing these patients. Yeah. Um, one question that I had actually, which I was thinking about too, just thinking how, you know, sensitive and how urgent we need to make sure that we're treating and, you know, getting the correct therapy for these patients. When you guys have patients who have arteriopathy, do you a lot of times like in the clinic beforehand almost make like a stroke action plan for them? Because I can imagine in some of these children's hospitals, right, we would have the capability to do, you know, rapid MRI, but certainly that ability to perform a pediatric thrombectomy might be a little bit limited. And so I think maybe just getting those resources on hand quickly um, would be something that would be nice to plan ahead. So I was curious how you guys counseled families um, with arteriopathy. Right, so um, 
So there's, from a counselling point of view, we highlight them that, well, we always give people and our families hope first. And that is that, you know, um, we recognise and acknowledge the shock um, that they must have that their child had a stroke because most people have no idea that children have stroke. And so that sort of floors them immediately. And that's the first sort of hurdle to get over. And then they just want their child to survive. And so you get them past that and their child survives. And then you can sort of build up their, um, their courage over time. But those first that first week is a tricky week. And sometimes if it's a dissection, you know, for longer, it's quite tricky. And so you really do have to tell your plans to the specific stroke type. So what I mean by that is, you know, you're asking a question about arteriopathy, I know, but, you know, we know that if it's a neonatal stroke, we can um, tailor our counselling in a much more uh, confident way because we know that recurrence risk is less than 1% in that group. As you suggest, though, if it's arteriopathy, then they have a higher risk of stroke and how to be prepared for that. Well, if it's facies, they don't have much of a risk of stroke at all. If it's moya moya, um, we're all over them. So they, you know, they're, they're highly counselled around fluids, activities when it's hot, making sure that they carry their water, taking their aspirin, sleeping. We think other risk factors matter. So, you know, we are, like I say, all over them like a rash. And if anything happens, call us. So they have our nurse practitioners. Um, number and we're kind of on fast dial. They're a small group and we think that they're set at such a high risk that that much more um, individualized tailored approach is, is sustainable and appropriate because not everybody understands or nor has the information to know what level of risk those children are at. Um, if we're talking about a child with transient cerebral arteriopathy though, or FC or current FCA focal cerebral arteriopathy eye inflammatory type, those children are um, high risk really in that first six weeks to three months. So that's when we're again all over them. Um, you know, contact us, stay on your aspirin or anticoagulation if that's what they're on. Um, you know, we know how they're doing, we're looking for them. Um, so those parents are counselled in a way that, you know, you're good if you're good at the time and you leave the hospital, but contact us if you're concerned. And our colleagues, both in Emerge and our neurology colleagues and DI will contact us if one of those children comes back within that sort of um, from, you know, time of presentation to six month time frame when they're higher risk. And then their risk seems to sort of peter out, actually, and they typically don't have a recurrent stroke after that first six month period. So you can be relatively confident we leave them on aspirin. So there's that group. Then there's the dissection group who are different again. And um, they are a very scary group. Like they're the children who die um, actually. And so, you know, I pause because we had a child who died last year who had the dissection diagnosed in another institution appropriately um, in the spring, was treated appropriately. There might have been a period where they were off their anticoagulation but, and should have been on it, but that would have been only for a week. And six months down the line has a, a further stroke, which is, you know, ischemic stroke, which was managed appropriately. But then, um, you know, weeks down the line has a hemorrhagic stroke in a different arterial territory and we still don't really understand what happened and you know those children have recurrences acutely for sure but also beyond that six month period and so again we just know them and so I think it some, somehow somewhat speaks to the value of having within any program ideally more than two people just because the decisions are um, difficult and they're high risk and so you kind of need a buddy um, you know who really focus on stroke and spend the time and know those patients and then how do we you know so that that's the sort of counseling of the parents but the institutional preparedness is key so we're always talking to our colleagues whether it's in DI or PICU or Emerge we feed back to them so you know they that they know why we worry and um, the good outcomes, but when we have poor outcomes, you know, we stop and we think why and we share. And so 
about preparedness and counsel. The preparedness is very much an institutional thing and about communication. The counseling is um, about understanding um, the real impact, morbidity and mortality in, in these children by um, specific stroke subtype and acting accordingly. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much. Um, we had some more questions in the chat. Um, Dr. Sanjay Lambor wanted to say thank you for a great talk, but I was hoping if you um, could provide some comments on the mechanism of late onset seizure. And he said specifically kind of one to two years after an initial stroke. Yeah, so um, I expect that's related to the gliosis and the scarring that's occurred within that area. And so um, that's because that's what they're left with. And essentially, then it depends on that focal area that's been injured, how eloquent it is and how really important it is from a sort of epileptogenesis point of view. So there's a very um, good article, I actually think it's a beautiful article by um, Wagner et al. And you've probably seen that one in pediatrics where they talk about um, seizures and the association between location of stroke injury and um, the odds ratios of, of and the sort of the risk of having seizures down the line. And the long and short of it is we know that if your stroke involves the thalamus, which is known to be really key in epileptogenesis and then um, epileptic pathways, that your odds ratios go and your hazard ratios go up through the roof, like to above 12. And you can have large strokes um, with less of a hazard ratio associated with, with seizures if they don't involve the thalamus uh, and just involve you know, parts of the basal ganglia, but you add in the thalamus, it takes it all the way up. So when you ask about mechanisms, um, and, and why it matters later on, but didn't matter earlier on. So we think that the sort of epileptogenesis at an acute, from an acute time point, well, we know that the, the infants are more likely to present the seizures and we think that that's just got to do with that developmenting, that developing brain, it's much more excitable, it's much more excitatory, that's important for development. And so that's why we're seeing um, you know, more seizures at presentation in that group, but then who and why, um, that 20% develop seizures down the line. We don't have you know, specific precise clarity on that, um, but where we are in the literature right now is understanding how the location matters probably more than the, the volume, and that it's probably a network related problem. And those networks are important in epileptogenesis. If they're disrupted, then your risk is likely gonna be higher. Thank you so much. Um, we had another question from actually Dr. Dana Cummings. Um, and he says, you and your colleagues at Toronto are lead authors of Felling et al's 2020 Annals of Neurology study of outcome after stroke. How did the variation in outcome with age influence your thinking about post-stroke plasticity? It's a really, really fascinating space um, because as, this, as you know, Dana, this U-shaped relationship between um, age of insult, age of stroke and recovery. And so it seems like there's this sort of sweet spot from a, a critical neuroplasticity or potential from neuroplasticity point of view, um, somewhere in early childhood where, you know, if you, if you, I call it a sweet spot, sweet spot, but it's actually not. Like if you get your injury at that time, your outcome is worse. And so, um, Neuroplasticity in of itself is, I think, one of the more, if not most fascinating areas um, in stroke that stroke can contribute to right now, because we have this pretty clean injury at these different developmental time points that tell us um, by virtue of the outcomes in these children at group level that neuroplasticity is not linear <laughs> and, and it's not like a, an, or an in or an out way, but that U-shaped relationship is really important. Um, you know, how, how it's driven what we do, well, from an acute management point of view, we, I think we kind of do the same, you know, we, 
child presents with a stroke and we institute hyperacute therapies and they go on anticoagulation if that's appropriate, aspirin, and, you know, and prednisone and so on. But what it is driving us to do is in what we call stroke imaging laboratory phase two is try and interrogate that U-shaped curve and understand what's the difference, what's changing in those children and that what's driving that balance between vulnerability um, and plasticity essentially and, and um, you know, where the, where the tipping point is for good recovery. I don't think we have the answers yet. We know that it's, a, it's about networks. We know that it's about um, critical time points throughout where things different, uh, you know, our motor comes on at different times, to language comes on at different times, to social behaviours come at different times. So, you know, we think that hierarchical plasticity, concepts of crowding, concepts of, um, you know, uh, maladaptive neuroplasticity, all of the, these different concepts around plasticity are what are influencing um, those outcomes that are somewhat unexpected, but we're now coming to terms with. Not all plasticity is necessarily good. Is dystonia evidence of maladaptive neuroplasticity? You know, so it's a really interesting space. And I think you know, papers like the Failings et al. paper um, and others that have gone before it are showing us to some extent how much we don't know. Um, but that's good. <laughs> it, you know, it, 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 it keeps us going. Thank you so much. Um, we had another question um, from Dr. Amy Haltrow, um, and she was asking, could you speak to the role of rehabilitation, specifically early rehabilitation in the PICU and comprehensive rehabilitation after acute hospitalization? Yeah, um, thank you for asking that question. It's so important um, to for us as often acute um, physicians recognize the fact that that acute window in a child's um, medical lifespan, if I put it that way, is a pretty short one. And actually, that it's it, we have much more opportunity to make a different child make a difference in that child's outcome if we figure out how to harness that chronic that, cr that chronic period um, by implementing the right rehabilitation therapies and so um, we think we believe it's important um, we believe that first we have to recognize the deficits as well as know that many of them may be emergent as they're not necessarily apparent at the time that they're inpatients but also pay attention and so I have to say that in a very personal way, I find it really soul destroying when, you know, we have a child who had a large MCA territory stroke and they've survived it and they're, they're not, they don't have seizures and, you know, they're doing pretty well at school um, and we've, we've known them from age five, six. And as they come through, because they haven't had the access to therapies that they ought to have had, um, they have a limb length discrepancy and they're beginning to develop a scoliosis and plus minus get back pain. And I know whether I see it or not in my time frame that as an adult, a young adult, they're gonna, they may have hip problems and back problems and so on. And I just think, you know, we ought to be doing so much more early on and being on it from early on. And so, um, you know, we are, again, just fortunate, but I think it's about communicating need and helping people understand why we think these children need to be seen acutely. Um, there's a recent paper out by Victoria Sherman highlighting the fact that, um, you know, a high proportion of children have swallowing difficulties following the stroke, and um, we dismiss it. Sorry, Thomas, we, you, uh, you know, we dismiss it and that we actually much, ought to be much more thorough about that and, and in much more, um, you know, I guess have it a, a part of our practice to do conduct those assessments, but not only as an inpatient, when they're discharged, the often what happens is that if they seem well at discharge, then they don't get PT or OT follow up. And we are all over our community colleagues 
um, but are able to be so because we make sure that we follow the children regardless of age or stroke, we follow them all until they're 18. So that we're also always assessing um, whether there is something emergent from a neurological point of view that needs PTOT or speech language therapy input so that we can advocate um, for that input from the rehabilitative services um, in the community. So it is of paramount importance. And then, um, you know, from a research point of view, we're trying to um, show in a more definitive and clear way that early makes a difference to some of these late bad outcomes too. And so that is a large part of what um, myself, but my colleague, Eliza Pulsine and Trish Domi are also um, very much working on. Thank you so much again, Dr. Domini. And we're so grateful to have you speak to us this morning. And again, so excited just to hear about all the fantastic work you guys are doing. Um, we do have some more questions. We're gonna actually go ahead and transition from the webinar portion of the morning to the meet and greet. And so um, if everyone who is on the webinar right now would access the link to go to that portion, we will continue on with questions and kind of transition to that portion of the morning. But again, thank you so much. Thank you. So